Uh, I have a, actually, this is a symbol I have a little bit of trouble with because I actually learned my astronomy in America. I was a PhD student in America. And when I returned for a long time, I had to catch myself and not call it Z. It was very strange because I thought of the letter as Z, but this, this astronomical use of it, I always thought of as Z rather than Z. Anyway, Z uh, is uh, the symbol that astronomers use for measuring redshift. So it was a big deal in astronomy, I guess, at the beginning. It started the, maybe the beginning of the 20th century. People started looking at the light from galaxies out there. And this was actually before they were known to be galaxies, so they were referred to as nebulae. And people started looking at the light from these nebulae and found that, that they were all redshifted, which means in this interpretation of, of you know, where this redshift comes from, uh, it means they're all running away from us. So in fact, there's even a few objects that have blue shifts. There are things that are actually coming towards us rather than going away from us. One of the most interesting things that actually has a blue shift is the Andromeda galaxy. So the nearest big galaxy to the Milky Way, the Andromeda galaxy, actually has a blue shift rather than a redshift. And that means it's piling towards the Milky Way. And in fact, in about three or four billion years, there's going to be a big collision. The two galaxies are actually going to crash into each other. So by measuring the redshift, or in this case the blue shift, you can actually figure out when that collision is going to happen. What's going to happen then? What would that look like and be like? From our perspective, it's going to be remarkably dull, I have to say, because the thing you need to remember about galaxies is they're almost entirely empty space. Uh, if you built a scale model of the Milky Way and you made the sun the size of a marble, um, then the next nearest star, so the next nearest marble, would be about 50 miles away. Um, so basically, galaxies really are mostly empty space. So if you take one load of empty space and another load of empty space and crash them into each other, they kind of just pass straight through each other. But what does happen, of course, is that the pull of gravity of, of the Milky Way on Andromeda is going to do terrible things to Andromeda's kind of arrangement and the same thing the other way around. Do any stars at all hit each other? Very rarely. If you do the calculation to try and figure out, because they're mostly empty space, they mostly just miss each other. And you'll probably find in, in a collision like that where you've got 10 billion stars on the one hand and 10 billion stars on the other hand, at most maybe one of them will smash into one other one. So this re is really not a particularly common event. So it's very much akin to the kind of Doppler shift that everyone's familiar with. You know, when a uh, fire engine or a police car goes past you and the siren, when the thing's coming towards you, it's slightly higher pitched. When the thing's going away from you, the pitch is slightly lower. And so the pitch changes depending on the relative motion of these two things. So that's the, the Doppler shift in sound. Um, the same thing happens with light. Uh, the way I like to think about it is that the universe has expanded. So let's say this is the universe at an early stage, maybe you know, 10 billion years ago. The universe is continually expanding, remember. And this is a photon of light, and that's the wavelength of the photon. So it's quite a short wavelength, so that means it's quite a blue uh, photon of light. But then the universe expands, as we know. So let's expand the universe. So the universe has expanded significantly now, and you can see the wavelength of the light is, is significantly longer. And that means it's a redder photon of light. And that's what gives you the redshift. It's the stretching, the expansion of space-time as the universe uh, expands. And so, and that's one of the neat things about the redshift. By measuring the redshift, you not only know the distance to this galaxy uh, using Hubble's law, which I know there's another video about, but you're also looking very far back in time. How did you know they were redshifted? How did you know they just didn't happen to be more red? So what you actually look at is you don't look at just the general light from things. What you say is absolutely true. If you just see a bunch of red light, you say, well, maybe it's just something that's red. Uh, perfectly reasonable to do. But conveniently, nature kind of provides us with little markers in, in the spectrum um, so that if you actually break the light from a, a star up into its constituent colours, so you put a prism or something and break the light up, you do indeed see the colours of the rainbow, but superimposed on those colours of the rainbow, you see little dark lines. And each of those little dark lines is where some element in the atmosphere of the star is absorbing light at a very specific wavelength. And so those provide nice little markers that are very specific wavelengths. So we can do the experiment in the laboratory and measure exactly the wavelength they're supposed to be at. And then you go and make the same measurement on a star and you find that the little dark band due to absorption is at a different wavelength. So you can see that it shifted towards the red. So this was from a long exposure on an 8 meter telescope in Chile of one of the faint galaxies in here. I couldn't tell you which one. This is 4,000 angstroms. That would look blue to your eyes. This is about seven or 8,000. That would look red to your eyes. So this is an optical spectrum. Um, but if you were closer to that galaxy, all of these lines would be shifted and compressed over to the blue part of the spectrum. So this spectrum has stretched, basically, as the universe has expanded. And then we measured it with our telescope, and we can determine how far away it is. 
So it, this is one of those strange quantities that actually is completely dimensionless. As long as you use the same units and do everything consistently, you end up with a dimensionless number. So the redshift is actually defined such that if you have one of these little dark absorption lines, say you have some hydrogen which is absorbing at a particular wavelength, and you can make that measurement in the laboratory, and you measure its wavelength to be a, a certain number of nanometers or angstroms or any unit you want to measure it in, and then you measure the same thing in a star, you'll find it at a different wavelength. So you can measure the difference between those numbers, how much the wavelength has changed, and then you just divide that by the wavelength you started with. And because you are dividing something in nanometers, a change in wavelength, by something else in nanometers, and it, or the wavelength you started with, you just end up with a number. And then it doesn't matter whether you measure that measurement in nanometers or furlongs or whatever you want, any unit of length you like, you'll always end up with the same redshift. I'm leading a project right now where we can detect galaxies to redshift of six, which means the light is stretched by a factor of seven. So what does that mean in terms of the evolution of the universe? The light left those objects over 12 billion years ago. It's, it's actually it's mind-boggling when you think about it. I mean, uh, we're, we're studying galaxies in the universe's infancy. We, we could produce images of these galaxies, study their characteristics, understand what elements are present, and we're seeing them before the Earth itself was even formed. So this is a project that I was talking about. Uh, we've used many hundreds of nights of telescope time on a large telescope in Hawaii, the UK Infrared Telescope, to try and understand galaxies in the very early universe. So we're using an infrared telescope precisely because of this redshift effect. If you study a galaxy in the very early universe, the light has been stretched by such an extent that the normal optical light that most stars produce has been stretched into the infrared. So up until fairly recently, our, our understanding of the very distant universe was very biased because we used optical telescopes. All the optical images we're all used to from Hubble and so on. When you're looking at the very distant universe, you only see a tiny fraction of what's going on out there. So what we're seeing here is uh, an image that we produce by combining data from an optical telescope in Hawaii with an infrared telescope. So anything that looks blue there, you would be able to see with an optical telescope, or if you like, you know, your eyes are sensitive to that light. Anything that looks red, for example, these red blobs here, those would be completely invisible to an optical telescope, even to the Hubble Space Telescope. So as we pan across this image, you see that there are galaxies of all different colours. Here's a very bright blue star in our own galaxy. It's so bright that it produces bleeding effect on the CCD camera. That's not real. Uh, it's just because it's so bright, the electrons spill over on the detector. So that's kind of a star in the foreground that's ruined your photo. Isn't Absolutely, it? yeah, they're a real pain, they get in the way. What we're really interested in are the blobs that you see behind. So most of the things you can see in this image are galaxies. So here's a particularly beautiful blue spiral, a relatively nearby spiral. Actually, I'm not particularly interested in that one. What I'm interested in are the fainter blobs in the background. Those faint red dots that you can maybe just see, invisible with an optical telescope. We now know from studying their redshift that those are galaxies uh, that we're that, that, that whose light left the objects more than 10, 11, 12 billion years ago. 